go then. There you go. Uh, once we do our uh, initial orientation to the organization here uh, by me now, uh, we'll start uh, with a keynote address by a distinguished pair of collaborators who's, whose work together, I think, really embodies the theme of this assembly. Uh, we're then excited to offer a workshop uh, put on by our research committee entitled Making an Impact with Your Research, uh, which will discuss research methods in global surgery. And then after a short break, we'll return uh, for a panel discussion and academic collaborations for system strengthening before closing out with a, a few next steps and some upcoming events. During the sessions, we invite everyone uh, to really please communicate uh, with the speakers during those sessions and each other uh, by asking questions through the chat. And we wanna really make this a, a fun and interactive uh, three hours. <clears throat> Next. All right, so um, you know we all know that academic global surgery, uh, it really involves the application of research, education, and evidence-based advocacy towards clinical surgical care in regions of health inequities, and that's the idea of the field. The primary goal of it is infrastructure development through academic partnerships worldwide with the delivery of uh, high-quality surgical care uh, to all, regardless of location. The AAGS's role in this uh, is really to organize and cultivate AGS programs, uh, to promote bi-directional partnerships, and to develop the next generation of global surgery uh, leaders worldwide. Currently, we offer five membership categories and 17 committees that aspire to really cover the range of individuals and issues uh, critical to the current and future work in our field. Uh, additionally, we hold biannual meetings, uh, one in the spring, and another one uh, in the fall. We currently have uh, 183 active and affiliate members, 129 associate members, and 126 student members uh, for a total of 438 members across 47 countries and more than 100 institutions. Now, the AHS uh, came together around the idea, as I said, and, and, and the passion for developing, unifying, and advancing academic global surgery programs globally. Uh, while our first members uh, and their programs were in North America, the aim from the beginning has really been for AHS to be a global organization. We want to engage LMIC members and programs. Uh, however, we need your help with that to spread the word, to join, and to get involved in the work of the organization. We want everyone as part of the membership uh, and the leadership of the organization. And I think there, and I'm excited to say that our next spring assembly will be held in an LMIC location in hybrid format. And uh, additionally, uh, we aim for 50% of our organizational leaders uh, to be from LMICs uh, by 2025. Today, uh, and people are still logging on, but uh, the assembly, uh, was is host, uh, today's virtual assembly is host to 170 registrants from 31 countries. Of the individuals registered, 51% uh, are women, more than half are in training or non-MDs, and almost a quarter are from non-surgical fields, including anesthesia, OB, emergency medicine, or in business or public health, all of whom are critical uh, to the work we do. Our uh, current committees uh, really represent the work we aspire to do and they're uh, shown here. There's 17 of them as we talk about across a range of everything uh, that uh, represents global surgery. In the way of updates, uh, we recently held a strategic planning leadership meeting uh, to establish uh, an initial kind of true north for the organization to orient us to the large buckets of work we do and the stakeholders that we strive to serve. Uh, I want to specifically thank Circles International for facilitating that session, uh, Operation Smile for, for financially sponsoring that work, and uh, the entire leadership council uh, who are here uh, for their efforts in, in spearheading uh, this uh, initial strategic planning meeting. Uh, so the AAGS has begun kind of formal relationships with other organizations, including Incision uh, and its national working group, uh, GSSA, uh, as well as the Global Surgery Working Group of the Research and Associate Society of uh, the American College of Surgeons and Operation Smile, as I mentioned. Uh, through these relationships, we've held a few events uh, specifically aimed uh, at bringing together leadership of programs with people coming into the field, students and trainees who are interested in global surgery. And then uh, most recently, we presented a video abstract on AGS 
uh, and its purpose and, and this vision that, that we have for this during the 22, 2022 conference of the Consortium of Universities in Global Health. Uh, there was a 10 minute video, it's available on our YouTube channel and will also be played during the break today. Uh, we're excited to really continue broadening these formal relationships across organizations throughout the world. Uh, moving to today, uh, I want to specifically call out the individuals who have made the content and the dissemination of today's programming possible. Uh, Drs. Nunez and Geisling uh, from the Congress Committee, Drs. Chin and Nkamstra from the Research Committee, and Dr. Jiap, Fritas, Ulhasan, and Tate uh, from the Information Technology Committee. Thanks to uh, all you guys for the hard work you put uh, into this to, to give us this event today. We're going to move into our um, research workshop. Dr. Savannah Geisling is our vice chair of the Congress Committee. She's an academic foundation doctor uh, in the UK, and she'll introduce our, our panelists. Thank you again so much, Dr. Duliard and Dr. Tishon Mafia, for your really inspiring and educational keynote addresses. We're now moving on to our first session, which is titled Making an Impact with Your Researchers and is moderated by Dr. Nkamstra, who is the Vice Chair of the AAGS Research and Quality Committee. Thanks so much for, uh, for joining us. It's so wonderful to see colleagues, mentors and friends today. Um, we have a great turnout, um, participants from around the world and from really all levels of training and practice. So. Uh, depending on where you're joining us from, good morning, uh, good afternoon, or good evening. So this is the, the first workshop on research that the AAGS is hosting, and we're looking forward to hearing from three engaging speakers. Uh, so as all of us in global surgery know, it's one thing to do research, but another thing entirely for that research to have an impact. An impact can only happen if we're asking the right questions using rigorous methods and if we have a plan for effective translation. So we have three speakers who will be joining us today, and I'll be introducing each of them right before their talks. Uh, they're going to be discussing the topics of getting started in research, uh, the use of qualitative methods in global health, and finally, the implementation of quality improvement programs in diverse contexts. Uh, so feel free to type your questions into the, into the chat box as you think of them. We'll be monitoring the chat box, and after all three presentations, we'll be uh, posing your questions to the speaker so everyone can hear the questions and answers. So our first speaker today is Dr. Felix Oyanya. Uh, Dr. Oyanya is a pediatric surgery fellow, lecturer, and PhD student at Embrara University of Science and Technology in Uganda. He holds an MMed from Makarara University and an MBCHB from Mbarara. He has a dedicated interest in children with surgical colorectal conditions and the psychosocial impact to the child and family. He's coordinating multiple studies in this area, including family support groups, a mobile health program, and a study to understand depression in these families. He recently received a Thrasher Early Career Research Award to investigate the feasibility for primary repair of anorectal malformations in Uganda. Uh, so he's, a, he's currently a Fogarty Glocal Fellow and a UCSF Chase Fellow. Uh, Dr. Oyanio will be speaking to us today about getting started in research, so take, it, take us away. Thank you, Joshua. You can see my screen okay? Yeah. Yeah, um, thank you, um, AGS, for this opportunity. Um, right, um, I'd like to start with my background. Um, I come from Northern Uganda, that's a rural uh, near DRC border. Um, I went to Makere in Kampala for my residency, and then moved to Mara, my fellowship, um, which is the only specialized center for children's surgery in the entire Western region, uh, second to a national referral uh, in Kampala. And, and we have only eight pediatric surgeons in the country, uh, which will be uh, about 200 based on our population estimates. Um, as you can see in this picture, this is our daily OPD uh, number for pediatric surgery. And you know, Uganda is a, a young country with over 50 
population being children, um, meaning that have a very high clinical burden with limited resources. And these patients usually present late, and most of them come from rural settings uh, with poverty and the communities are not sensitized. Therefore, we have significant backlogs with uh, weightless surgery. Um, coming to how to get started, I'd like to walk you through my path to my research career. Um, I will start by saying that there must be a driving motivation. Um, how did I get this? Um, through my clinical observations in my residency and my medical school, uh, the concerns of the children and their families that I serve and the community. And then um, it was a requirement for my uh, residency uh, to complete to have a thesis. So uh, at that point, I really had my experience with research. And, and, and I imagine myself in an ocean and you don't know how to swim. This is the first time. And you're calling out for help. Um, however, I needed to get started. That brings me to the point that you can't get started unless you get started. Uh, at that time, I then met my uh, primary mentor, um, Professor Doruk Osgitz from UCSA, um, who had come for his uh, routine teaching trips to Kampala, Makere University. And, and, and that evening, I was really frustrated on, on what to do. Um, the College of Health Sciences was asking for a project, and I had nowhere to start from. I remember I went, I didn't know what to do. The following day I came to my supervisor, I asked him, but we have all these children and we don't know anything about them. You operate them, we don't know how they are doing. He said, that's a research question. And I think I didn't know the research question, but then when I met uh, Professor De Roo, and uh, he told me, you know what, I'm going to help you walk through this. Therefore, um, that um, brings me to the second point that sometimes you have clinical social problems at your bedside. Um, you just need to uh, get started. So we have uh, congenital coronary conditions which are often treated in one stage or two to three stages less than a year in high income countries. But our setting, these patients present late and they do not run complete treatment early. And we have the high, uh, a very high burden of congenital colorectal conditions and our population and hash burns. So I said, why don't we take advantage of that? Of course, the other high burden of acquired conditions like interception, intestinal perforation, the special type of which we still have. And when these children get colostomies or ostomies, they are faced with a burden to their families, especially the mothers. Um, they cannot be accepted in school. They are socially excluded. The family get fragmented and they have significant psychological uh, problems. These are some of the slides to show you uh, some of the challenges our communities face. You can see the first slide. The colostomy was poorly placed. It is closing off. For the hash fronts, the colostomy was not placed in the right place. You see a prolapse. And then on the uh, lower end, the left lower end, you see the colostomy was not placed in the right place. So we are uh, dilated well. And um, you can see the challenges the patient is going through because of care for the stomachs and one underwent multiple surgeries and the stomach is even disappearing. So um, I then realized that we have these rare challenges in, in our setting and I thought doing some case reports and case studies is a way to go to describe all the clinical challenges reflecting our challenges in our healthcare system from the patient-centered view. And then we had to document our local workgrounds, identify the relevant gaps in knowledge, and we take advantage of the clinical guidance and 
make the world know what um, these children go through. So we had a few case uh, reports um, that we published. Um, about my thesis question. Um, so I asked myself, how do our children actually do? There's no previous work on this long-term outcomes of our children and our confirmations. We have a rich database uh, with support our collaborators, um, which is a great resource used by both our local research and our collaborators. Why not take advantage of that? So we adopted survey tools. Uh, of course, the major challenges were tracing these patients with the contacts that they gave us. However, I managed to publish um, this. And from the same database, we published about 10% of our work that's uh, out there. Um, this was my first uh, publication um, with support from um, my supervisors and mentor. It gave me confidence, uh, you know, you get some of the reviewers who are harsh. Sometimes they ask questions, don't even know what to do. But that opened me uh, for further important questions. It allowed me to even help and be a resource to my colleagues and, uh, and, and, and the residents as well. And this motivated me for greater advocates for children and their families. So one of the things that I thought was very important was to form a support group for patients. And we have seen this as significant impact. Uh, we can now see these children earlier, they report with the uh, congenital parental conditions earlier, but we designed this based around the strong informal network these patients have, actually these patients communicate. So through this, we see parents uh, with an information of colostomy teaching each other how to care for stomachs because we do not have um, limited uh, specialists in stomach care and limited stomach care appliances. This was a launch. Uh, on the right is our hospital director with my site supervisor and my mentor in a uh, fellowship program, Dr. Martin Fitzwala. Uh, then what's our current work? Uh, we're already doing a pragmatic trial to see the feasibility of uh, primary repair for low and information in courts. Um, why we believe any intervention, if we can just reduce the number of stages of operation from three to even just two, that will have significant impact in the lives of the children. We thought this will likely decrease the number of children and division of stomachs. They will go to school earlier, they'll be accepted in the communities and attend social events. We are planning for prospect to work with Hash Frank's disease, um, supported uh, hopefully uh, by NIH, uh, of course. Um, but uh, at the moment, we have support from NIH Fogarty and Prussia One, as well as Chesa Fellowship. Uh, which has greatly improved my experience with such methods and scientific writing. Uh, and I was really priv privileged to have these opportunities. And we have a mobile health program uh, to revolutionize blood test for care um, in Uganda with support from our collaborators from Duke University, uh, led by Dr. Sergeant Commander and uh, mentored by Professor, Sir, uh, Professor Tamara Fitzgerald has been a very great resource to us as a unit. So we're collecting data on developing men, men and health program for care coordination because currently families do not have any means of communication with us, apart from traveling to the hospital. However, we've had challenges uh, navigating research during uh, the pandemic, and we've lost a significant number of healthcare workers. Through the member health program that we started, we were able to show that there's really delay in pediatric record care that leads to ancestral health care expenditure for patients. And we have also seen that there's a very high uh, hidden mortality in Uganda for children with congenital anorectal malformations or congenital anomalies in that case. Uh, from still uh, the M, uh, M health program, we have shown that over 34 percent of patients have their cells scheduled at least once, and this led to unnecessary time and cost for these patients. And more than unnecessary trips to the hospitals required for over 83 patients, and 39 
patients had more trips of five, more than five. And we've seen the nutrition of the children tend to improve after surgery when this health program was initiated and, and, and we uh, can see this has really greatly improved our care for these children. Um, however, we were surprising to find out that over 76% of the children were not allowed in school or they were uh, not at, allowed to attend school because they had a colostomy. So uh, some of our ongoing local initiatives to strengthen surgical systems for children in our center, we are doing uh, auto models for outreaches to our communities. As I speak, we are just doing a one week um, outreach uh, in one of the uh, outcasts of, of, of this country with support to, to, from our collaborators still. We are doing training in surgical emergency for children in rural centers, especially uh, we think that these outreaches may not be sufficient to help in case of emergency still so training the general practitioners, what we call medical officers and local context to deal with some of these emergencies. This has helped improving our referrals to our center. And we're in incorporating children's surgery into our surgical policies and plans. And we're setting standards for metrics in coverage and access to reduce the backloads and wait list for surgery for children in our country. And our partner with uh, some leading global children, NGOs like Kids of R, which has supported us with uh, infrastructure operating theaters for children. All these have been aligned in our research programs. What is the lesson that we've learned? I must say that we have translate system research to patient care and keep it locally led and relevant to our frontline providers and communities. And for me, this is a very big lesson that I have learned uh, from these uh, collaborations and these initiatives that we're having. This slide, just shows uh, how collaboration, sharing knowledge and research ideas, learning from each other is very, very important. The first picture on my left is my, my primary mentor. I met him during my uh, residence program. And then um, uh, importantly, we learn from each other, even the residents come from my countries. Our colleagues, um, they come and operate with us. We share knowledge and we have fun. Uh, this shows some of the outreaches that we're doing, and this was what we had last year uh, in one of the out outreaches uh, in this picture. You can see the volume of patients that we are faced with, and, and, and the communities are eager to learn, and we can see the OR is filled with many people who are waiting to learn. And, and, and thank you so much for this opportunity, and I, I'm really uh, honored uh, to have share my experience on how to get started. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Oyanya. Uh, so our next speaker is Dr. Yustra Shawar, who is an assistant scientist in the Department of International Health at uh, Johns Hopkins. She holds a joint appointment at the Paul H. Nitsa School of Advanced International Studies. Her research concerns the global governance of health and the politics of health policy processes. Her research has been funded by numerous organizations, including uh, Save the Children, USAID, and the Novartis Institutes for Biomedical Research. She was involved in um, a WHO UNICEF Lancet Commission on Child Wellbeing, as well as three Lancet series concerning early childhood development, gender norms and equality, and political science and global health. She's also written a seminal paper using qualitative methods to assess the political priority for surgical care globally. Uh, she received her undergraduate and MPH degrees from University of Virginia, her doctorate from the Department of Public Administration and Public Policy at American University, and she was a postdoctoral fellow at the School of Social Policy and Practice at the University of Pennsylvania. So she's going to be speaking to us today about the role and conduct of qualitative research in global health policy. Dr. Shore. Of course, I'm muted in talking. Do you see my slides? Uh, yeah, you're, we see your speaker view though, so. Oh, okay, so I always have that problem, but that's okay. Okay, I'm just gonna 
I like it for my timing purposes, but let me just, I'll just put it in presenter view. Is that good? Can't see it quite yet. Okay, let me, sorry. You would think after all this time on Zoom. Okay, and then. Perfect. Perfect. Okay. So thank you so much all and thank you for the nice introduction. Um, it's a pleasure to be speaking with you all today. Um, really the aim of uh, this really quick presentation is twofold. One is to really demonstrate the value of applying qualitative approaches in surgical system research. And two is to walk you through the basics of how qualitative methods can be applied. Um, and just a huge asterisk, it's really impossible to do justice to the subject in 10 minutes, but my hope is at the very least to um, spark further interest in applying qualitative um, methods in your own research agenda. And so given our time, I'll just quickly summarize what qualitative research is um, and then delve into some basics on how it can be operationalized um, and end by highlighting um, uh, its value in, in better understanding and ultimately improving surgical care systems and experiences. Okay, so what are qualitative methods? Um, in a nutshell, um, it involves an investigator's collection and analysis of non-numerical data. So this is text, video, audio, um, artifacts. Um, and the aim is really to describe, um, explore, explain, or, um, uh, or explain some sort of social phenomenon, um, whether that be an experience. So for example, a patient's experience in trying to access a surgical intervention or a behavior, so why surgical trainees and providers are leaving a particular country, or an event, so how a health reform shapes access to surgical care for a particular population. The important thing to emphasize is that the, uh, the method is really applied in real world or natural settings. Um, in other words, the, the investigator is not manipulating or controlling the environment, um, for example, through a randomized control experiment. Um, and additionally, qualitative methods are um, centrally interested in understanding and really unpacking, you know, the meanings, experiences, opinions, attitudes, interests, and kind of beliefs of, of the involved participants. So qualitative methods are, um, as you all know, fundamentally dif a different way of approaching um, research compared to quantitative methods. Um, and, and this is because of the contrasting paradigms and assumptions that underline each of these, these methods. So many qualitative researchers largely subscribe to a positivist um, phil philosophical paradigm, whereas many qualitative researchers um, embrace an interpretivist uh, paradigm. And these differ on a number of key attributes. And I just want to highlight a couple here. One is around the nature of reality. So positivists um, believe that you know, an objective reality exists beyond the human mind. Um, and there's one single truth um, that is being sought after in an investigation. And in contrast, um, interpretivists see knowledge of the world as intentionally actually constituted through a person's lived experience. And so therefore, it's impossible to have one truth. And there are multiple truths that are being sought after in an investigation. And the second difference is around an investigation's focus. So positivists um, seek to capture you know, what's general, average, or kind of representative. And so here, generalizability is really important. Um, and in contrast, an interpretivist is very context-driven and fundamentally seeking to represent kind of the specificity um, or uniqueness of a particular object of investigation. And then finally, these two paradigms differ in their expectations of um, the researcher and the subject's relationship in the investigation. So positiv positivists, you know, seek a rigid separation in order to, you know, not bias the outcome of the findings. That's kind of what they're after. While um, interpretivists, you know, find that separation is actually quite impossible, and it's actually not a desirable. It's not desirable given their um, belief that, you know, the relationship between the researcher and the subject are fundamentally inseparable. And so, um, you know, this perspective embraces more of an interactive and participative um, dynamic between the two. 
Okay, so now I'd like to shift to making this a bit more practical um, by walking us through some of the key considerations um, in applying qualitative methods, starting from translating the problem into an appropriate research um, question, all the way to analyzing qualitative data. And I'll, I'll use a qualitative study that, um, that was mentioned that I led back in 2015, examining um, global prioritization of surgery as, as an example. So um, as you all know, whether a qualitative or quantitative um, method is, is, is uh, most appropriate really depends on what you're trying to understand about a particular problem. So for example, one problem that intrigued me and that I observed um, is that despite a high burden of surgical conditions, um, there was little political attention and action for this issue. And this problem can be studied um, obviously quantitatively, you know, for example, by asking how much funding is dedicated to the issue, you know, where policy commitments um, have and have not been made to strengthen surgical um, systems. Uh, obviously, these are all really important questions. Um, but qualitative methods really provide access to, um, to, to areas that are not amendable to, to quantitative research. And I especially um, want to bring attention to that they um, provide access to the how and the why. So, um, for example, um, you know, this problem has been investigated uh, qualitatively multiple ways. And I, I list here just some examples from the literature, um, you know, looking at it at the national level, for example, looking at it, it, it in Uganda in one country, across multiple countries, looking at how prioritization varies across multiple countries. And then um, my study, which was looking at it at, it at, the, at the global level. And the takeaway here is that um, qualitative research questions really should be able to enable one to really explore, describe, or explain a phenomenon more in detail versus systematically measuring variables or testing hypotheses. Um, so your research question then determines um, the, the best methodology, method methodological approach. <clears throat> and I highlight just a couple here. Um, for example, a, a narrative approach really entails collecting participant stories and narrating a synthesis of their stories. Um, a phenomenological approach is largely used by uh, psychologists. And here the aim is to explain how a phenom phenomenon is experienced at the time that it occurs. Um, and ethnography, um, is largely used by anthropologists, and, and this one's it's a unique approach um, in which investigators are fully immersing themselves in groups or organizations to understand the culture. And then finally, a, a case study approach, which is the approach that I utilized in um, examining the challenges around global prioritization of surgery. This really seeks to develop an in-depth description and explanation of a case. And that case could be an individual, a group, an institution, a set of institutions, or, or at a particular event. So then the next consideration is the data that's needed. Um, um, given, and, and specifically given your research question, you wanna think about what kind of data do you wanna collect and from who and from where. Um, and here I list just a number of the major types of qualitative data that are frequently used um, in my research, um, looking at you know, why surgery wasn't prioritized at the global level. I triangulated primarily between documents and here it was peer reviewed literature, organizational reports, policy documents and media. Um, and then also interviews. And um, I number that I actually want to note and, and thank again, I know there's a couple of uh, people on this call who I actually uh, interviewed back in the day for this project. Um, and here, you know, I was interviewing um, people who um, were heavily involved in advocacy um, and, and shaping the surgery agenda and also um, observers of this agenda and also policymakers and decision makers. And here the key element of um, my approach in, in these interviews was really gaining the trust of the key informants so that they opened up about their strategies, their motivations, and their frustrations, um, which was really crucial to uncovering uh, hidden element, elements about this process, the policy process, excuse me. All right, so then related to da data collection, um, and in particular with respect to interviews, um, you have to think about your um, sampling strategy. 
Um, and again, it's really important um, to, to think about according to what you're trying to get at in your research question. Um, and so for my study, I adopted a purpose of sampling where really my selection was intentional um, given my aim to only interview the decision makers, advocates and policymakers that were influencing discourse around surgery. So for me, it wouldn't make sense to uh, interview a patient or a youth advocate, um, people who are not shaping the discourse at the global level. And again, my, ident my identification of these individuals was largely based on an initial document review and also a consultation with kind of some key stakeholders in this area. But then I also employed a snowball strategy in which um, I asked those who I was interviewing who, I, who they thought were the most pivotal voices influencing uh, global su surgery at the global level. Um, and then I included those names that came up repeatedly um, in each of the interviews. All right, so then finally we come to the, the, um, the stage of analysis. And this is um, where the investigators systematically extracting information and meaning from the data to answer the research question. Um, and there are multiple kinds of um, analyses uh, and qualita qualitative analyses in here, just highlighting a number of them. Um, content analysis is where the investigator is really connecting predetermined codes or themes to a relevant excerpt. Uh, to, to relevant excerpts of data. So they're really coming up with the codes first and then going to the data. Um, thematic analysis is the reverse. Um, uh, this is where an investigator is, is kind of going through the data um, and then extracting and generating codes as, as they're going through that process. And this is largely inductive. Um, and then constant comparative analysis is, is a, kind of a mix of the two where the investigator initially generates codes, themes, theory um, to the data for the purpose of then confirming or refining or rejecting um, it, it. And I applied this um, in my study where I originally coded largely drawing on a policy framework, but then my codes were kind of tweaked and refined according to what I was discovering um, as I went through the data and the key informant interviews and, and so on and so forth. So, um, all right, so then just to conclude, I, you know, I hope this quick talk just provides you some inspiration in incorporating qualitative methods into your own research. Um, it's, it's a powerful tool and I know it's actually, um, it's a difficult tool, especially given um, the constraints that many medical journals allow in, in, in your word space, but it's um, one that I think, um, does a couple of things, can do a couple of things for, for this field. One is generate new ideas. I mean, given that it provides access to areas that are not amendable to quantitative research, you really can begin to discover the how and why, which can enable us to kind of uncover novel problems and opportunities that we wouldn't have thought of otherwise. Um, and the second is that it can generate meaningful insights. Um, detailed descriptions of people's experiences, their feelings, their motivations around um, things it can be instrumental in better designing, testing, and improving surgical systems, as well as provider and patient experiences and outcomes. And then finally, um, qualitative methods can actually more inform more targeted um, quantitative research by really providing a description of phenomenon and even informing the words or themes of focus um, in subsequent questionnaires. So thanks again, and um, I look forward to discussion with the panel. Thank you so much, Dr. Shawar. Um, so our final speaker, Dr. Marta McCrum, is an assistant professor at the University of Utah, where she practices uh, general surgery trauma and surgical critical care. She completed a health policy fellowship and a master of public health uh, at the Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health and did her residency at the Brigham and Women's Hospital. Uh, before she moved out west to complete a trauma and critical care fellowship at the University of Washington. Uh, her research examines disparities in access to care, the impact of socioeconomic factors on health outcomes, trauma care and outcomes more broadly, and quality improvement. Uh, and she has specific expertise in the implementation of quality improvement processes in resource limited settings, which she's going to be speaking to us about today. Uh, so she wasn't able to join us in person, but will be uh, delivering a pre-recorded talk. Uh, so let's queue up Dr. Marta McCrum.
healthcare surgeon and health services researcher at the University of Utah. Um, thank you to the Association for Academic Global Surgery um, for the opportunity to speak today. I, I'm sorry I um, am unable to be there in real time, but I'm excited to talk about our um, group's experience um, with quality improvement um, through a collaborative approach. So without further ado, I will share my screen. And I'm going to speak today mainly about our approach to quality improvement um, in, and developing a quality improvement program and some lessons that we've learned along the way. So as we know, the five, past five to 10 years have seen a growing recognition of the importance of high quality healthcare across all healthcare contexts. Historically, global health efforts have spoke, focused on expanding resources and access to care with quality assurance perhaps taking a back seat. And this is changing now. Um, there are calls to start a quality revolution in global health. And members of the Lancet Global Health Commission um, issued a report in 2018 that stated there is an urgent need to expand the solution space for quality, quality improvement, as poor quality care is now a bigger barrier to reducing mortality than insufficient access. And we know that over 8 million people in low and middle income countries die annually from treatable conditions, with over half of them dying to, due to poor quality care. We started exploring quality improvement efforts through a collaboration with the Volta River Authority Hospital and the Ensign College of Public Health in Ghana. And the map gives you an indication of exactly where, where we're located. Um, the VRA Hospital is a district hospital in Akosomo, Ghana, with a regional reputation for providing high quality care to a largely rural population. And as the healthcare component of a large hydroelectric corporation founded in the 1960s, the VRA hospital has uniquely developed as a hospital within an engineering context. Um, it maintains a close relationship with the engineering component of the corporation with regards to institutional safety. And this really gave it a unique, um, a, a unique approach to quality improvement across all areas of its care. And so we started exploring this um, through a collaboration with, um, as I said, VRA, the Ensign College of Public Health, and the University of Utah. And we started by um, first asking um, how a low resource hospital can optimize their available resources to achieve this goal of high quality care. And research has shown that safety culture, teamwork, and communication are associated with improved outcomes across a variety of clinical settings. And in surgery, we know that an institution's culture often manifests in its perioperative processes. As, as surgeons, this is something that speaks true to us and that we can see every day. And so we hypothesize the BRA's ability to provide high quality care stem from an underlying culture of safety and process standardization that's typical of a high risk engineering environment. We tried to approach this in an organized way and, and first um, perform an institutional baseline needs assessment. Um, so we issued two quantitative survey tools. Um, first, the safety attitudes questionnaire um, we administered to a range of hospital providers and administrators to measure their attitudes and perceptions in various safety related domains in healthcare. And then we surveyed a number of patients um, using a modified HCAP survey to assess the inpatient experience um, after surgery or throughout their surgical experience. And then finally, we paired that with observations of perioperative processes for a range of surgeries. And we found that there were high scores from employees and, and leadership with respect to teamwork and safety climate across the hospital. We also found very high or relatively high patient satisfaction scores and over 90% of the patients that we surveyed would definitely recommend VRA hospital for, for surgery. The perioperative observations were interesting because we found um, first very low process variability. We, we made process maps of typical general surgery and obstetric procedures um, to assess um, waste and, and variability across processes. And we found very low process variability. We also saw other high quality behaviors such as um, there was 100% adherence to the WHO checklist, which was very impressive. They used closed loop communication in the operating room and there were flat hierarchies. Um, and, and therefore we found, really thought this represented consistency between our um, assessments of safety, climate, patient satisfaction and processes of care, suggesting that strong safety culture and attention to quality of care may translate into reliable perioperative processes. And furthermore, this observational study demonstrated that developing a culture that fosters 
behaviors and practices characteristic of a high-performing hospital is feasible in a low-resource setting without significant financial resources. We then dug a little deeper by gathering some quantitative, qualitative data. To develop the QI program, we thought we really needed to understand how our partners at BRA thought about quality in their specific cultural and clinical environment. In the United States, the Institute of Medicine frames quality improvement around six aims, safety, timeless, timeliness, uh, efficiency, effectiveness, equity, and patient-centeredness. And this framework has been widely utilized and an adapted version was promoted by the WHO um, in 2006, but few studies have actually analyzed whether these constructs are applicable um, in a low and middle income healthcare setting. So we had two goals, first to explore local providers' perception of the concept of quality, and secondly, to identify context specific opportunities for quality improvement. We interviewed 14 staff members comprised of physicians, nurses, pharmacists, and some trainees, um, and, uh, and, and found a few recurrent themes in our, in our interviews. First, with regards to the concept of quality, um, patient satisfaction was very much one of the predominant themes. Um, the providers emphasized clear communication between patients and providers, timely provision of medical care, and personalizing care to individual patients. The, the terms customer service came up a surprising amount of the time. Um, most par participants also described resource availability as a prerequisite for high quality care and a central limitation for many hospitals in Ghana, which was not entirely surprising. Secondly, we asked about targets um, for quality improvement for, um, at their hospital. And participants and respondents in our, uh, in our interviews described that consistent, robust data collection was essential for quality improvement efforts. And without outcomes tracking, participants felt that they could not adequately assess clinical effectiveness and make meaningful changes. And so this was something that really came up as a, a clear need. We also talked, um, they also talked about process standardization, and this was, was very important. And they, they emphasized this as a key technique because they found that a common challenge is staff turnover and constantly needing to train new staff. And so standard practices could provide guidance, give reassurance, and reduce practice variation. Um, and finally, although most participants were enthusiastic about quality improvement efforts, um, they were concerned about how to assure staff engagement with quality improvement over time, um, particularly adding more work for people who are already stretched and overworked was a, was a concern. And so overall, we found strong alignments within the six domains outlined by the United States Institute of Medicine um, with our experience at the single hospital in, in Ghana. Um, but also, you know, on top of the, the quantitative and survey data that we had already collected, we found that qualitative data really revealed important nuances um, and insight into how to approach our QI partnership, um, particularly um, the, the terms resource, the use of available resources versus resource availability, um, and the importance of having capabilities to track clinical outcomes. And so we took this information and we developed a, a quality improvement program that was really focused on surgical care for resource limited settings. Um, our goal was to develop a, um, a program that was broadly applicable, that was sustainable, um, that was low cost, and that was really focused on creating a culture of safety, um, education um, focus, and, uh, and um, room for capacity building in, in QI at this hospital. I'm going to take you through the four components really briefly here. Um, first was uh, training a clinical quality champion. Then second element was um, supporting a, a mor morbidity and mortality or case review conference, um, developing capacity for process standardization. And finally, the, um, the desired goal of, uh, of developing a, a data collection system. And we approached this um, through a coaching-based program, which emphasized the priority needs and the growth of the clinical team at um, the target hospital above all else. So with regards to the clinical quality champion, um, we again really focused on education and training in quality improvement skills. Um, and this was developed, by, developed and delivered by our value engineering team. Um, we focused on goal setting, process mapping, root cause analysis, implementation, these sorts of things. And I'll show you our curriculum in just a minute. Um, in terms of our, our outcomes, um, we focused on, on outcome measures like the ability to lead quality improvement activities, to being able to develop a culture of continuous quality improvement and, and those skills that we described. 
Um, this is our, our educational curriculum. Um, it's very skills focused, um, and we every you know every module we, we develop when we discuss certain tools. Secondly, the Morbidity and Mortality Conference, BRA already did this very well, but we supported their M&M conference and, and you know, talked about how to integrate um, some of the QI skills um, that we had uh, involved in our, in our educational modules, such as root cause analysis to identify problems and in indirect interventions. Our outcome here was developing an effective forum for case review um, that identifies opportunities for, for improvement and increases quality and patient safety. With regards to process standardization, again, we focused on training um, and our outcome measure was the ability to design standardized processes and protocols and then implement them where necessary. Um, and, and they ran with this um, and out of, out of this program, one of the things they did while we were working um, together was developing a preoperative assessment clinic for identification of high risk patients and preoperative planning, which was not in place before. Um, and finally, data collection, we've talked about the need for data collection and the desire for standardized and reliable data collection tools. Um, the desired outcome here, um, and this is still very much a work in progress, is the development of a, a um, data collection platform for, for tracking outcomes. Um, and, and now, you know, there are many groups doing this and, and certainly larger collaborations, including at the WHO, um, to, to come up with a set of essential metrics um, and an integrated data system to do this. And I think that's wonderful. We held monthly meetings um, through this pilot program. Um, every month we would um, review the prior month's um, materials, um, set some go new goals, do an education session, have a discussion, and then again set tasks for the next month. Um, and all of these sessions were recorded and available online. Unfortunately, um, the second half of our pilot program where we were going to assess the, the effectiveness was interrupted by the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, and so our next steps are to follow up on the durability um, of, of this program and um, the persistence of skills and, and techniques um, in their clinical context. Um, and then also investigate some strategies that were used um, during the COVID-19 pandemic to address the, the needs of the institution um, and whether the, the skills and um, the, the culture that we, we really um, collaborated um, on developing, whether, whether that came into play and was, whether that was helpful. Um, we're also developing new collaborations um, and we'll assess the generalizability to their clinical environments and are, are starting to, to work on a program specific to trauma and burns. Thanks so much again to our speakers. There's uh, really so many different ways to do impactful work. And uh, in future session sessions, we hope to focus on other methodologies to really cover the rich field of, of global surgery research. So we're running a little tight on time. So we'll leave uh, questions to the chat. Uh, please feel free to continue the discussion there. Uh, and if you're a student, an early career, or even a later career researcher, and you're hungry for more resources to help you or your trainees get started with research, the AAGS has put together a list of resources that you might find helpful. So I'm going to take a moment and put the link in the chat there. Um, so there's a couple links, one to the, um, the list of resources, um, and there's a second link. Uh, if you come across any additional resources that you think might be useful, feel free to send it over to us. Uh, this is intended to be a living resource and we hope to continue to grow it over time. Uh, so thanks again to all of our participants. Uh, we hope to see you at the next session. Uh, sorry we didn't have time to, to get to questions, but please uh, continue the discussion in the chat. Um, as we close the panel, um, we're going to turn our attention back toward kind of where we're at with the AAGS and, and a few next steps before we close. Uh, hopefully right on time. Thanks again. Uh, let's see. Chris, you're up. Kathy, would you mind sharing the slides? Perfect. Uh, so hi, everybody. Um, I'm uh, Chris Dodgen. I'm a trauma and acute care surgeon at the Medical College of Wisconsin, and I have the um, uh, good fortune of serving uh, as the current treasurer of AGS. I just wanted to, to mention a couple things. Um, uh, things to look forward to. Um, so uh, please uh, look forward to uh, committee self-nominations uh, opening uh, in the fall of this year. Um, please uh, consider self-nominating um, or nominating others uh, with their consent for a position on one of our many committees. As uh, mentioned by um, Dr. Krishnaswamy, we're aiming 
um, to have a greater uh, LMIC representation in our leadership. Uh, and this is a great way to, to go about getting that. Um, there will be positions available for all the committees. Um, for more information about the committees uh, and their goals, please go to the link at the bottom of this page. Um, uh, it's a two-year position uh, with uh, half of um, the members of the committees turning over on an annual basis, um, and it requires just a brief statement of interest. Um, please uh, consider, um, again, that self-nomination process. We do need um, your ideas and leadership. That's how we're going to continue uh, to move uh, the work of this organization forward. Um, and then finally, um, uh, if you are new um, to the AAGS or your academic institution is new to AAGS, we are looking for two representatives to, to um, uh, be the representation from your academic center to sit on our institutional representative council um, who will help guide uh, the goals and work of AAGS and our committees. Um, uh, again, uh, I think was mentioned earlier, we have over 100 institutions um, uh, currently involved in the AAGS. Uh, we've not gotten um, uh, complete representation from all of those uh, institutions. If you um, uh, are a member and would like to represent your institution, please reach out to the leadership um, and we'll get you involved in that um, representative council. Um, you can see on this slide kind of how the representative council um, uh, correlates with um, uh, the membership and, and the leadership council and, and how we um, kind of uh, gain significant direction um, from uh, that uh, institutional council to guide us on, on what work we should be focusing on to strengthen all of our um, uh, global collaborations and partnerships. Uh, thanks, Chris. So we will have, we're planning a fall assembly. Um, we are planning semi-annual assemblies. Our fall assembly, um, we're hoping to be in uh, concurrent with the American College of Surgeons meeting. It will be in person and virtual. So we're looking for uh, interactive or uh, novel interactive approaches to a hybrid meeting. Um, we are planning this to be more research focused and we'll be accepting abstracts. We should have more information for you in, in the next month or so. Uh, and, and to reiterate, uh, our goal is to have the spring assemblies in person and hybrid and basically rotating continents. So we don't wanna stay um, in, the, in the US or, the, or in North America. We, we want um, to, to, be, to be everywhere and to have a, a global membership and global leadership. Um, I'm beyond excited as how this, at how this um, Congress has gone. But I think there are ways we can improve and I, I would personally love to hear from anyone that has ideas. So please email me um, with things you'd like to discuss, topics you'd like to touch on and any, any approaches that come to mind. Um, so thanks so much, everyone. Hi, my name is Mamta Swarup, and I'm a trauma critical care surgeon. I'm also the president elect of the Association for Academic Global Surgery. And we wanted to remind everybody that as a reminder to join AAGS uh, so we can continue to grow the organization and achieve more for advancing surgical care um, all around and together. Um, we wanted to kind of review some of the membership benefits. Um, as you can see today, we have uh, people from all over the world, um, and we would like to continue to allow for more networking and collaboration with colleagues globally. Um, we have program programmatic development that occurs throughout the year. Um, we also have biannual meetings, as you guys know and have just heard about, and we plan on having more webinars and workshops in person and virtual. Um, so you can join uh, AAGS through this uh, bit.ly if you just copy paste this or, or just uh, type this in. Um, and also we have a QR code here that uh, will easily allow you to join the organization. So with that, um, hello again. I just wanted to thank everyone also for being here today with us and we hope to see you at the Fall Assembly 2022. Uh, here's our website, our um, email address that you can reach us through. Uh, please follow us on social media. We are on Instagram and Twitter and we would love to hear from you. And we have a YouTube channel that you can subscribe to, which is Association of Academic Global Surgery. Uh, today's assembly is recorded and will be added to the YouTube channel as well. Um, and there is a QR code again now for our entire website. 
with that, I'd like to pass the mic to Dr. Krishna Swami. Um, I don't really have anything else to add. Thanks everyone for your participation and uh, hope everyone has a great rest of the day. Please fill out the post survey and we look forward to seeing everybody uh, as members of the committee, spreading the word, uh, working together and uh, seeing each other again uh, in person in the fall. Thank you.